<laughs> Welcome to the Southern California <laughs> Prep Insider Football Webisode Podcast, whatever you want to call it. Tommy Morris and Shotgun Spratling here to bring you our top 10 some players of the week from last week. We've got Jessica out of Marietta Mesa. We've got Beverly out and about as well. Shotgun, how are you feeling today? I'm doing great. You know, it's, it's exciting that the season has started a little bit earlier than normal, but, you know, I was happy to get out to the field, and, you know, see some football, get some uh, guys popping the pads and stuff uh, last Friday. Yeah, an early start for uh, for the high school football season, a week early to accommodate for the playoffs. So that means we got our first round of games early. We get our official week one top 10 coming at you right now. Shotgun, what do you have for yours? Starting at number 10, uh, Westlake's going to stay there. 35-30 win over Sierra Canyon. Uh, you know, they got De- De Gabriel Floyd cleared about 48 hours before the game, but not their speedy wide receiver, Terrell Vaughn. Uh, they also had tight end Seth Figgins out. So you know what? They just moved running back Seth Heller, I mean, Jason Heller, out to a receiver spot, and, and you'll let him uh, score four touchdowns, 205 yards receiving, three in the air. He had another one rushing the short Small guy, just jumping over dudes, you know, doing it all for for Westlake. Uh, if they can get everybody back and healthy, uh, then we'll see if Westlake can move up the rankings a little bit. But th- they come away with the victory. They stay at number 10. Number 9, I got Upland. They beat La Havre 24-12. to Taj Davis, two TD catches. Cameron Davis, over 100 yards rushing. And then Justin Flo, baby man, did a little bit of everything, like always. He had a sack. He recovered a fumble. He tipped a pass that led to an interception. That defense is always going to be good with him in the middle of it. So they stay at number 9. I got Cajon at number eight. They beat, they beat up on Helix. I mean, Helix is supposed to be good down in San Diego. Tommy, tell me what's going on with Helix. I thought they were supposed to be one of San Diego's best. 43 to three, though. Six foot nine foot, uh, six foot nine wide receiver Darren Jones just committed to Utah. Congratulations to him and to Utah for getting a, you know, a playmaker out there. And Jaden Daniels, six touchdowns all in the first half. So uh, Cajon's at number eight. I got seven. I got Jay Sarah. You know, I moved them up a little bit. They put a wow. hurt on Corona Del Mar. Uh, they have 49 to seven. Thought that might be a close game. It was not. Jay Sarah looks like they're for real. We'll talk about them a little bit later when we uh, get to our game picks. Um, number six, I got Oaks Christian. They beat Shamanad 31 to 13 behind Zach Charbonneau. He ran for 192 yards, three TDs. The Michigan commit, though, had 165 in the second half. He turned it on when he needed to. Uh, they get the win there. They're number six. Orange Lutheran moved them down a couple spots to number five. They beat San Juan Hills 27-7. Uh, we're a little bit sloppy to begin with. And, and, you know, it was an emotional night for Ryan Liskey, the quarterback's first game since his brother Tyler's uh, death in January. He was playing for him. He's wearing his number now. He was emotional after his first two touchdowns. A little bit, you know, a little bit off, just a bit, just a bit with some of his passes. I think they'll get that corrected. They'll need to get it corrected. Big game this week against Centennial. I got them at number five. Definitely can move up this week uh, with, with a good performance. Number four, Mission Viejo. They beat Bakers to a Liberty 34-10. to 10. I got them staying at number four. Number three, Centennial actually jumps up a couple spots. They showed they've just reloaded with a 35-13 win over Chandler, Arizona, you know, Arizona's uh, state champion coming in. They just beat up on them. You know, the defense shut out Chandler in the first half. They were really, really good. Gary Bryant was just dominant on the outside. A uh, small receiver that just makes guys miss and just takes it to the house. Nine catches for uh, 265 yards at three TDs. 64 yards, 70 yards, 50 yards. That's a playmaker right there. And then, the, you know, they're platooning at the quarterback position. You know, the quarterback still combined for over 400 yards passing. So uh, they got a big game, obviously, with Orange Lutheran. That's going to be one of our top matchups. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Bosco still at number two. They beat Temp View 49 nothing. One of you. That's not enough. Top That's two. enough for you to put them on. Nah, you know they, they got a, you know modern day was still good, still good too. So uh, you know Bosco beat up on them. They outscored them 21 nothing in the first quarter. They outscored them 21 nothing in the second quarter. They only allowed 113 yards for the game. But I'm gonna leave them at number two for now. You know we'll see how this week shakes out. Modern day at number one. They've got a big game. They're going on the road to, to play, play the always powerful Bishop Gorman in Las Vegas on Friday. Uh, you know, Bryce Young was a little shaky in his first start since, you know, taking over for JT Daniels, the transfer from Cathedral. He had two turnovers in the first half, a couple overthrows. He only threw for 108 yards. He also ran for a touchdown. He didn't really need to do much, though, because modern day – his running, rushing attack was just dominant. You know, Shakobi Harper and, and Sean Dollars tore it up on the ground. They had 235 yards combined, five touchdowns. They only had 21 carries, so averaged over 10 yards a carry between those two guys. Now, one thing is concerning about uh, modern day, you know, they got the 
14 win over Bishop Amat. You know, very similar score to last year. They, they won by 20, I think, this year, 24 last year in their opener against Bishop Amat. They have 15 penalties for 138 yards. You know, if you're going to play a team like uh, Bishop Gorman, you better you better cut down on the penalties or else it might be a, a long night. So we'll see if the rankings shake up after this week. You know, we've got some big games that could, uh, could determine a lot of things. Yeah, so the top 10 as voted on by the SC Prep Insider clue, crew, excuse me, very similar to yours at number 10. Long Beach Poly, number nine, Jay Sarah, uh, the, the new team in the top 10 after uh, week zero. Upland at number eight, Cajon, number seven. Orange Lutheran at six, Mission Viejo, five, Oaks Christian, four, three Centennial. That was a game I was at when they were um, when they were playing against Chandler. Very impressive. When you saw the two teams run on the field, it, it looked like, you know, Chandler had these some, some big, strong athletes. And personally, I was thinking, man, you know, these, these kids might be in trouble. But Centennial put on a show, to say the least, completely just knocked off the uh as you were saying the arizona defending champions the team that was ranked number one in the state coming into it they outclassed them in every single way especially defensively centennial's defense looks very very good a challenge a team that has a bunch of d1 guys on their offense and they were just stymied the whole entire game so good things come for centennial i think number two modern day now that game against the mock kind of scared uh the sc prep insider crew a little bit moved him down from one to two and Bosco just looked really, really strong that first week. So they're, they're at number one now as far as we're concerned. Okay, we'll see. We'll see how it plays up this week. We'll, this is the week where we'll really find out more about that modern-day team. Uh, you, you know, with, with all the weapons they have, I think they'll put it together after the first week. And plus, they're the champs. Gotta not, somebody's got to knock off the champs before someone takes over that spot. I guess that's fair. All right, so looking at some individual players from last week, Shotgun, who do you have? You know, we'll start with modern day just since so, so we mentioned it. Uh, since I didn't mention it previously, Sean Dollars, you know, talked about combining with Jacoby, uh, Jacoby Harper for a big night. Sean Dollars only had eight carries. He still had 120 yards. He had three touchdowns, and he had an 87-yard touchdown called back by a penalty. So if you had that one in, he would have had nine carries for over 200 yards and four touchdowns. I mean, the, the kid just went off. You know, and they, they were saving him. So, you know, they could have gave him some more carries and maybe all of a sudden that score is a little bit bigger against Bishop Amat. You guys are, uh, you know, freaking out a little bit too early for me. <laughs> Nathan Manning at Capistrano Valley. He's a Cal baseball commit, but, you know, also a quarterback there had a really good uh, night 20 for 29, 340 yards for some touch, add some touchdowns in there, 42 7 win over Tustin. How about Kaleo? Halahaki from Edison, 95-yard interception touchdown for his team's only points. They lost the game, but yeah, you got to give credit for a guy that, that the defense gets the only points of the game for him. Speaking of defense, how about St. Margaret's defense? They allowed the team to win seven to two. They took a, they got a goal line stand from the three-yard line after an interception return set up Aquinas. Doesn't matter. St. Margaret's shuts them down, and they scored two points on their own. So uh, you give a lot of credit to that that group right there. Well, yeah, so final score seven to two, right? Final score seven to two baseball score. What if what if you, you and I'm just in my head picturing like you know a lot of times defensive coordinators have like rewards for shutouts. I think they get multiple rewards there. I mean, you scored points, you had a shutout on but, defense, but you don't and, you gave up two points technically. Uh, you didn't give up the two points, so. <laughs> but it's not a shutout. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Well, you the kids are probably going to get like donuts on Monday if there's a if it was seven nothing. But nope, the offense had, had to give up two points. I think the fact that they, they shut down the goal line stand, I think that'll get them some, something. I mean, maybe it's not donuts. Maybe they get eclairs instead. I don't know. Okay, all right. Yeah, uh, yeah. what are, what are the crepes? Maybe some croissants. You croissants, never know what's yeah, going to happen go. at yeah. the St. Margaret's locker room. You, you can have any kind of uh, breakfast pastries. Okay, yes. Okay, that's fair. <laughs> Uh, also, look at look at Anthony Munoz from Western, 21-28, 354 yards, five touchdowns, and a 69-33 win. How about Zedekiah Sinners from Servite? What a way to start the year. Let's just, let's just you know what, let's not even wait. Let's not wait. 99-yard touchdown on the opening kickoff and a 17-7 win over Bakersfield. That's a way to get your, get your season started. Russell Sung, Portolo's first ever game. How about Russell Sung? 164 yards rushing and two touchdowns and, and their win there. How about that? A team, their first game ever. They've been practicing for two years. They get a team. Now they get, get to finally get on the field against another team, and they get the win there. Brian Pacheco from Los Amigos, 324 all-purpose yards in the 1917 win. How about Nick LaRiva? LaRiva. I kind of like that name. Nick LaRiva from Santa Ana. Four sacks in a four. The LaRiva. LaRiva. Four sacks in a 49-14 win over Buena Park. Uh, Josh Stupin. 
Fountain Valley, 403 yards passing, four touchdowns and a 40-28 win over Troy. He had 331 the first half, so that means he probably could have put up at least five bills in that one if they really wanted to press it. Brendan Hammond at Canyon, two sacks and interception. He caused a fumble. He had six tackles, including one for a safety. His team lost 41-15, but that's a, that's a heck of an all-around performance. Another guy who lost but had a great performance, Clark Phillips III from La Habra, Mr. Pick six is his nickname from last year from taking a couple back in a game. He had two TDs receiving and another interception, but uh, La Habra did lose to Upland 24-12 in that one. How about Riley Flininikin? Flininikin. We got some names We'll today. go for it. Yeah, that, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah, we'll count Yeah. Them. From Catella, 354 yards passing, five touchdowns. Included in that was eight catches, 183 yards, and four touchdowns from Edward Williams. They had a blowout win there. A couple more. I got Deshaun Thompson from Northview. Four catches. Only four catches, but he had 179 yards and a 48-14 win over El Rancho. Devon Booth from El Monte, 310 yards rushing, five TDs, transferred in from Las Vegas. You know, the you know El Monte got another transfer from Paraclete. Instead, uh, Booth was the guy getting the carries, 61-30 win over Baldwin Park. He just was outrunning guys all day. I, I watched those highlights, and it was not even close there. Bonitas, Cade Catum, seven catches, 190 yards, a TD, and a 42-24 win. Los Altos, Joe Reyes the third, two interceptions, including taking one back, 65 yards for a 35-27 win. Zaquan Irby from Ganesha, 281 yards rushing, four TDs. Kevin Romero from California, around 200 yards rushing, four TDs, and a 63-35 win there. Three more guys on my list. I'm running out of breath here, but I gotta know, get wow. these guys. They had, they had a good day. You know, a lot of good performances the first weekend. That's that's what happens. You know, when you got some of those non-conference, uh, non-division rival games you get some guys popping off for some big things caleb hervey san Jacinto, nine catches 189 yards two tds and a 46 win cerritos is db joseph quibrenter had 16 tackles that's a pretty good day for a db uh and then also give a little credit to to stephanie gallardo from saint uh saint genevieve she kicked seven extra points in a 55-0 win over sun valley poly always like to see the girls that get out there and play a little football too there you go. There's 100 people that shocking <laughs> that is eye on this week. I've got four. Uh, I'm going to go out to Apple Valley <laughs> for my first. Actually, five. I have five. I'm sorry because this is a double one. Uh, going out to Apple Valley for my first one. Um, Jeff Widener, the quarterback out there at Apple Valley, had five, 451 passing yards and eight touchdowns. Got to give a shout out to uh, Xander Witt as well. One of his wide receivers had 296 receiving yards and five touchdowns. <laughs> so, heck of a day for both those guys. And expect them. I mean, if they're all on all season long, there should be some records broken out there in Apple Valley. That's all I'm going to say. I mean, I mean, doesn't doesn't Wit go to coach and be like, coach, four yards, just just give me a little slant. So no, you in that case, you, you go to the stack guy and you just stare at him until he somehow finds four yards for you <laughs> in that spreadsheet somewhere. You just stand in also, front of him, you don't move. So that's how you had so many more yards receiving than I did in high school. Exactly. That's exactly what it was. Uh, um, that's you. the only way. Exactly. Um, next, we've got DJ Ford from Norco. Guy's about 5'5". Five five. I saw him play in scrimmage against Jay Sarah, but he's got a lot of heart. He had 229 rushing yards, 14.3 yards per carry in week one. He had a touchdown as well. Uh, next, we've got Jovan Camacho from West Ranch, 203 receiving yards and two touchdowns. Then I'm going to go to Fullerton. Jacob with a K, Jacob Garcia, three interceptions. Maybe don't three interceptions. Throw this way. Three interceptions, pretty good. But did you know he also took one of those to the house and he recovered a fumble? Jakob, Jakob is having a great day. It could be Jacob, could be Jakob. You know what? You're probably right. It probably is Jakob. Um, but yeah, I mean, maybe don't throw him the ball anymore. I would just stay away from him. Yeah, I would assign three offensive linemen for that guy after that day. <laughs> Yeah, maybe, maybe not the right person to be throwing towards. Uh, we got to get to our field reporters now. First, we have Beverly Pham out in Orange, Lutheran. Beverly, how we doing? Thanks, Tommy. I'm super excited that football season has officially started. We had a great first week of games here in the Trinity League, and my predictions from last week actually all came true because every single Trinity League school came out with a W. Shout out to Bosco versus Tim Few. The Braves shut out Tim Few 49 to nothing in their season opener. Also, shout out to Modern Day versus Bishop Amat. The Monarchs won 42 to 14. You can watch the highlights from that game on our YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram if you haven't already, along with an interview with Oregon Ducks commit. Sean Dollars. But today I'm here at Orange Lutheran and I got caught up with head coach JP Presley. Let's hear what he has to say. I'm here with Coach Presley. Coach, thank you so much for joining us today. Absolutely. Thanks for being here. 
So it's your second year as head coach. How are you feeling? You know, it's a... Uh, it's hard for me to say it's already been two years. I mean, it's been really exciting starting, kind of Im implementing uh, a little bit of Coach Presley's culture, um, but being part of Orange Lutheran for as long as I have, it's uh, kind of as if we've, I've always been here and it's never really stopped. Can you tell me a little bit about this Coach Presley culture? <laughs> Coach Presley's culture is be on time, do the things I ask you to do, and be accountable to your teammates. Is there anything you do differently this year versus last year? You know, I think just always being consistent, figuring out the expectations and being on top of that on a daily basis so the kids understand the importance of, of those things. How does it feel coaching at your alma mater? Oh, it gives me so much pride. It's it's exciting every day just knowing that uh, you were a part of something 25 years ago and here you are playing a role in the future growth of it. So you run a really tight ship here. There's no music at practice. Can you tell me more about that? Well, you know, they, we, we'll give them music on game day Fridays. You know, if we got to warm up, they get in the weight room. But uh, for me, I want to make sure that they're engaged at all times. They understand the instructions because we run a pretty fast pace. So uh, being engaged to our voices, our whistles in the next period is uh, super important. What happens when you turn the music on? <laughs> it's like a, everyone's dancing, everyone's excited, but they understand what needs to be done. But, you know, I think the good thing about having a great team like this of, of young guys is giving them an opportunity to be uh, young men and have a good time too, but then understanding when it's time to um, go to work. So here in the Trinity League, guys are always coming and going and transferring in and out. How do you deal with that situation? You know, it, it, it's unfortunate, It's it's uh, but it's something you embrace, you know, but it doesn't, um, you know, get you to a place where you start, you stop loving on the kids, like regardless. Um, you know, I think the culture wise is, you know, everybody wants it quick. They want it early. It's like a drive through success. And I think for us, um, just from our model is it's resiliency. It's four years. It's, it's learning to fail. It's learning to be successful. It's <laughs> learning to be taught, you know, and, and, and become a great mentor and a great leader. So for me, I look for, you know, consistency and buy-in. I mean, we always talk about being all in, which in, the, the flip side of that will make you go all out and that's what we got but yeah it's it's an unfortunate piece that's happening in our league in our section um, you know but you can't please everybody and you've got to make sure that you have the right kids that are all bought in how do you get new guys to adapt to the culture you know it starts with your leaders the guys who've been here um, since their freshman year guys that have been bought in they've kind of embraced that and kind of teach it but we're real intentional about teaching the things that are super important for us and what it means to be a lancer at orange lutheran orange lutheran is lucky enough to have a lot of really good starters returning to the program how do you think this season is looking you know always always uh you know a good coach always tell you you know you you, you want to always grow you always want to talk about the things that you may not be doing well I think we've got a team that is coming together um, in a lot of ways not just on the field but in the in the team room as a unit and that's where we're trying to really grow this team is, is to push that envelope there Orange Lutheran is facing Centennial this Friday. They have an interesting quarterback situation over there. How are you guys preparing? You know, I think it, it's it's really uh, a lot of times is they do what they do on offense, regardless of who the starter is. Um, obviously, each each quarterback has its their own strengths, but they buy into their system. And so, understanding how we're gonna, you know defend their system and be on top of their game is is not so much on which quarterbacks are in it's just what the history's been at centennial with coach logan thank you so much for joining us again and we wish you the best of luck this season thank you coming up this week we have a stacked lineup of games bosco versus garces memorial j sarah versus calabasas orange lutheran versus centennial servite versus norco modern day versus bishop gorman santa margarita versus mission viejo should be a fun week of games and i'm excited to see how it all shakes out sending it back to you tommy all right shotgun that's beverly's report from orange lutheran they got a big game this week hosting centennial i personally will be there i'm excited to watch it we're going to predict it later, so we'll ask about, I'll ask you about that later. But what, what are your thoughts on Orange Lutheran so far? It's going to be interesting to see how Olu kind of handles that uh, centennial offensive tack and how they're preparing for the two quarterbacks. Like she talked about, you know, that's uh, something that, that can create a little bit of a, a little trial and tribulation when you're going into a week against a big team. You want to, you want to prepare for everything, but, you know, they throw two quarterbacks at you and they do a little bit different things. So uh, I'm interested to see how their defense does. Their defense was really good last week against San Juan Hills, but much different offensive attack in Centennial than San Juan Hills. All right, we're going to go now to Jessica Lucero. Jessica is out at Marietta Mesa where they're celebrating. Well, what's it called in their 10th anniversary? What's it called? 
a decentennial. Something like that, yeah. yeah. Whatever. <laughs> Some high school kid with a better vocabulary than me, you can tweet at me and tell me what this is. <laughs> Jessica, it's all yours. Yeah, thank you, Tommy. I'm here at Ram Stadium where I was lucky enough to speak with head coach Daryl Turner here at Mira de Mesa. He is officially in his third season here as the head coach, and in his first season back in 2016, they went 5-6. and six. Now, come 2017, they went 9-4. and four. They're officially up to Division Three, and he said he's really looking forward to the competition that it entails, as well as this upcoming Saturday, they face off against Etiwanda, and they are at home, so that's something that they're also looking forward to. Let's hear what he had to say. I'm with Murrieta Mesa head coach Daryl Turner. Now, coach, this is officially your third season, and you guys have come quite a ways. Your first season in 2016, you went five and six. Last year, you went nine and four, made it to semifinals of C CIF, and now this season, you are officially up to Division Three. What are the changes that you're sort of implementing to keep this momentum going? The one thing we got to do is, you know, we're just making sure that we. Focus hard, you know, change the culture here, continue the culture where we're at. Um, having the kids, you know, buy in and, you know, understand that, you know, we play football here at Marietta Mesa also. We have two great programs here in Marietta. You got Vista, you got Marietta Valley. And, you know, a lot of times those two programs get all the limelight and, you know, we're the young school. You know, it's our 10th year opening up. Um, you know, if you think about football, you think about the other schools, you think about academics, you think about Mesa. So now we're just trying to change the culture, you know, just in the city of Marietta to get guys, you know, wanting to come here, you know, going to college, um, getting an opportunity in the classroom and, you know, playing football. You lost a couple of big guys with Miller at quarterback, among a few others. Uh, who are some of the some of the players that are really taking charge this year? When you look at our, our quarterback situation, you know, right now we have Austin Cochran, you know, who's coming back. You know, he was a backup, you know, with Jeff and, you know, being very patient, you know, a kid that, you know, had the opportunity to transfer and go, you know, other places. Um, hopefully, you know, he comes in this year, you know, and he leads the program and, and the offense, um, you know, with, with being, you know, just backup last year. But you have, a, you know, a sophomore coming up, you know, uh, um, Joseph Ayala. You know, uh, he was a freshman last year, you know, did very well. Um, they're competing for the job, you know, and Dane Wilson, you know, you got two 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 seniors, you know, really kind of sitting back. Uh, right now, I know uh, Austin's kind of, you know, taking the lead a little bit, you know, right now in front. So um, hoping that, you know, he does a you know, good job of, you know, lead, leading the offense. Uh, Keon Bars right now, you know, what, what can you say about him? Uh, probably going to be the best D tackle uh, in, in Southwestern League, hopefully, you know, in a division. Uh, he, ha he has uh, multiple offers, you know, some Pac-12 schools, uh, um, FAU, you know, they come all, all the way out, you know, offered them. So him being, you know, in the middle and, and playing fast, you know, doing well. Um, I have a all-league CIF uh, defensive end, Colin Layton, you know, for three years straight. We're moving him over to linebacker, you know, this year. Um, He's doing a good job at, at defensive end, but to get him recruited, you know, for some colleges to start looking at him, we want to make sure, you know, we put him back there, you know, playing that. And then leading up front, you know, uh, our left guard, left tackle, Nathan Orlando, um, we think he's going to make some real big strides of playing, you know, the guard spot. You know, um, a lot of colleges are recruiting him, you know, at guard. So instead of leaving him at tackle where we can probably be a little more comfortable with, how about we put him in a position that he's getting recruited, bit, you know, with at guard, you know, and taking care of business. So, you know, we, we, we have a, a lot of kids, you know, Jacob Zins coming back from last year that played real well, but we're really looking forward for these guys to step up and lead this team. Awesome. Should be great. A lot of changes going on now. Moving on to the Southwestern League. It's tough as always, but this past week, a couple of them did have their first games. Great Oak played San Jacinto, they lost 40 to six. You had MV versus Santiago, they lost 42 to 27. And then Shap versus Hemet, Chaparral took the win 24 to seven. Now, based on that first week, what are you really expecting from the Southwestern League this year? You know, the Southwestern League to me is one of the toughest leagues in CIF, mm -hmm. you know, um, Besides the Trinity League, you know, with, with all the all the privates, you know, we're 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 pretty balanced here. Um, you know, I I want to say, you know, I know we're in Division Three now. Division Three is a very tough division. You know, you got Santiago who played a Division One team, looked pretty well. You got Cajon who they're playing next, probably yeah. one of the best teams in the state. You got us in Division Three. You got Edowanda who's in Division Three. You know, we're open up with a Division Three team. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, the Southwestern League. We've gone through a couple of coaches changes. I know Coach can, uh, uh, um, Olson over at Vista Marietta, you know, he, he, he's now at Centennial. So um, Coach Peterson's now there. Mm -hmm. I know um, Coach, Coach uh, Duffy, you know, he's left, you know, Marietta Valley. Mm -hmm. You know, so Coach Wilson, you know, he's, you know, uh, solidifying his staff. Um, 
You look at Chaparral, you know, they got a brand new head coach this year. You know, you look at Temecula Valley with Coach Esposito. So um, the most tenured coach right now is, you know, Coach Robinson, you know, over at Great Oak. And they always find a way to pull it back, you know. So um, our, our, our preseasons may be, you know, a little bit rocky and shaky. But you know once you get into league, any given day anybody can beat you. So that's one thing we better make sure we pay attention to. It's always about staying focused on the up and coming week. And speaking of which, what are you guys really working on this week in order to prepare for Etiwanda? Etiwanda, hey, uh, they're athletic. You know, um, I've seen tape on them. You know, they got some kids. I know last week they had that battle of the 15, you know, playing against Summit, and they handled business. So I know coming in this Saturday, their first game jitters are already gone. You know, they're going to come in ready to play. They're excited. You know, um, this is a playoff game. Um, not only that, you know, this is our 10th year anniversary, our birthday, so we're inviting everybody out, you know, to come into to this free football game. But at the same time, there's a game that has to be played and won. So I'm just hoping right now that our kids, you know, the, the, the lights, the first game, we can get those first game jitters off a little bit and kind of come in within ourselves and find out who's going to be, the uh, you know, the stars that kind of lead us to victory. Awesome. Thank you so much. I look forward to watching you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Now, something else that has been going on in the South Southwestern League is, you know, there's been sort of a turn of events. We talked about it in the interview. Merida Valley, they faced off against Santiago, and, you know, they're, they're a competitor, but MV lost 42-27, to not really what expected. Uh, but this week they do have a bye week, and next week they're facing off against Cajon, so that's definitely a must-watch right there. Um, Great Oak also had a rough week. They lost to San Jacinto 40-6. to They do have a new quarterback, though, so I think he just might have been a little shaken up. It might take him a week or so to really get transition in. They do face off against King this week, so I think that should be an easy win for them. And then one other matchup that I'm looking forward to is Temecula Valley. They're facing off against Elsinore, so so that one right there, I think that should also be a win. So hopefully we get a couple of wins this week for the Southwestern League. I'm looking forward to it. That's all for me. Back to you, Tommy. Shotgun thoughts on the 10-year-old Marietta Mesa Rams. Yeah, I'm just trying to figure out what the 10-year anniversary gift is that I need to give them. I'm not sure. I'm, I, is it paper? Candles, candles make it, a nice gift. Candles. Uh, candles are always a good yes, gift. So uh, maybe gift. maybe we'll take some candles out when we go to Marietta Mesa <laughs> at some point this season. Uh, you know, Merida Mesa has to replace six foot six QB Jeff Miller, who's now at Towson. Uh, so we'll see how the offense kind of does. You know, they got they're trying out a couple different guys. They haven't really settled anyone yet. They have some solid defensive players led by Keon Bars, like Coach Turner said. So I think the defense has to carry those guys early if they want to be competitive. Yeah, and I'll say this, Jeff Miller, he's not just six foot seven. He's like a thick six foot. He is a big dude. Like he's he's not <laughs> a stick. That dude, I mean he could easily be a lineman, but he's got a cannon for an arm. So he, he's a he literally big shoes to fill there for the Rams. Uh, we got to go to our game picks now. Again, all these games that you are about to watch us pick will be available on the Fox Sports Go app, so you can watch them and critique us the whole entire Friday night. Just fl flipping back from game to game. Um, so, you know, definitely no, no pressure here, Shotgun. Uh, first game we got to talk about, it is Jay Sarah going to Calabasas, who is playing their first game of the season. You know, Calabasas has Jaden Casey committed to Fresno State. He's throwing to two really good receivers, Johnny Wilson and Micah Pittman, Oregon commits. Uh, you know, they have a different offense this year with Coach Clawson gone. We'll see how that kind of how they kind of prepare. I mean, Jay Sarah is going to, you know, they don't necessarily know exactly what they're going to expect from Calabasas. However, the Trinity League won their games by an average of 41-9 to last week, including Jay Sarah's blowout of Corona Del Mar, which was surprising we thought might be a close game. You know, that was a 49 seven game. They did it without USC wide receiver commit Muneer McLean. It was not, uh, he was not healthy enough to play, you know, Caden Bell, Columbia commit at two TD passes to Reek Luckett, but Luckett was even better on the defensive side where he shut down John Humphreys, Corona Del Mar. I think if they put him up against Johnny Wilson, that's a very good matchup there. Uh, you know, if, if Luckett has a similar night as he did last week, I think Jay Sarah has this one easily. You know, he did have some cramping issues. He barely played in the second half, but I think that, that Jay Sarah, uh, as long as Luckett is healthy, will go out there and beat up on Calabasas. Yeah, I think it'll be close because Calabasas is going to be fresh. There's really no tape on them because as you mentioned, they change the offense. The best you can do is kind of project based on seven on seven, but I really like Jay Sarah, a kid that I think is going to get a lot more run this week is going to be Chris Street, the running back. He only had 10 carries last week, but 110 yards and a touchdown is pretty efficient. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah a kid who uh, we talked to him before the beginning of the season, his goal is to try and break all the school records on the ground, which I think he will have a serious chance of doing. 
Uh, okay, again, I feel like Jay Sarah didn't even really let the, the uh, line out of the bag. Not the cat out of the bag, the line out of the bag. You like that? A little fun there. I appreciate it. Yeah, I appreciate in week it. One, yeah, because, because they were winning by so much, I think they got a lot more tricks up their sleeve that they have not shown yet. So I have Jay Sarah as well. Next, Narbon coming back to the mainland after the trip to Hawaii to take on Long Beach Poly. That trip to Hawaii didn't go so well for them. They got <laughs> no. they got pretty thumped in that one. They have to bounce back in this one. They've got a lot of guys, a lot of talent on that team. I think they will. I've got them beating Long Beach Poly, but this could be a really good game. You know, Long Beach Poly is coming off a win. Elijah Dolphin, you know, uh, had three sacks. He recovered a fumble. He had an interception. He took back for a touchdown in their 37-8 win over Dorsey. The defense, I don't think they even allowed a passing yard in the whole game. You know, their defense is much better than it has been in the last couple of years. I think I think that Keon, you know, Keon Markham, if he has another big night, you know, he had a TD catch and a TD return in the game against Dorsey. I think if he has a big night, they have a chance to win. But I think Narbonne bounces back. I think there's going to be a bad taste in their mouth. I think they come back to the mainland and get a victory. Yeah, it's always a tough trip going out there to Hawaii. It's long, long uh, traveler. But I like Long Beach Poly. You mentioned uh, Keon. I'm going to mention uh, Jayon Markham, his brother. Also another great player in secondary. And then Alex Austin, a cornerback too, another Division One recruit. So why did they not give up any passing yards? Probably because their whole secondary is going to play on Saturdays. Um, I, I will say this though about Narbonne. I mean, they're, they have one of the best offensive lines in Southern California. Um, with Jonah Tuna Nau at uh, a tackle. Um, they got a uh, Levia guard, uh, Pin- Pino Me, Pino Me <laughs> at uh, at center, and Tua tu- Pua at defensive tackle. I am killing these names. I'm sorry. I apologize in advance. Um, they also have a uh, Brandon uh, Crenshaw Dickinson up there as well. So they have a lot of good talent up front. I just really like Long Beach Poly in this one, as you mentioned. They're tough to pass on. Narbonne likes to spread you out, and they try and, you know, th- their whole game is we'll, we'll find the matchup against you that works for us. But I think against Poly, they're going to have a tough time doing that because Poly does have the athletes. Uh, next, Santa Margarita at Mission Viejo. So, wait, who are you actually picking? Because it sounds like you're going back and I forth. Said Poly. Okay. Just I, was, sure. I just want to make sure that the kid, the lineman got uh, mentioned on Narbonne. I just butchered all their names, so it's almost better off. Yeah, than we, we, we got to um, work on your Polynesian pronunciation. Terrible. Terrible. I, I cannot pronounce the name to save my life. Uh, anyway, uh, Santa Margarita at Mission Viejo. You know, people from Santa Margarita, 23 29, 324 yards passing, six touchdowns in a win over Bounty last week. You know, he's got a you know, much different defense he's going to be playing against Mission Viejo. Achille Arnold, you know, had a 96 yard interception return uh, last week. That's the type of guy he's going to be going up against this week, who's a guy that just plays all over the place. I love Achille Arnold. Play, he played running back last year when they had an injury. He's playing slot receiver, takes a 96 yard pick. I, li- I like it. I like it. And that's why I'm taking Mission Viejo. I think that they, you know, that, that they showed that they can, uh, they can play with the big boys once again this year. That's why they're in my top five. And I think that they will uh, take down Santa Margarita, give the Trinity League a, one of their first losses. Yeah, I like Viejo as well. I wanted to give some shout-outs to Margarita though, from last week. As you mentioned, the quarterback, only a sophomore, uh, Peter Caselli. So, you know, good good sign for them that a sophomore is able to step up and throw for over 300 yards and six touchdowns in his first game. Jay Thomas ran for 120 yards and two touchdowns in the first week, so they got on the ground as well. But Mission Viejo is just too solid, coming off a good win against Liberty at school from Bakersfield. I also want to mention ASU commit Joey Yellen. Threw for 224 yards and a pair of touchdowns. Jamari Farrell for the Diablos had 100 yards on only eight carries. So similar to the backs at Mission or at Modern Day, excuse me, a very very efficient night and not having to put too much wear and tear on the body. So I like Viejo here. Two more games left. Next one is Chaminade at Paraclete. One thing, great great to see Jamari Farrell back after having an injury last year. 65 yard touchdown run in that game. Chaminade at Paraclete. I've got Chaminade in this. They bounced back after losing to Oaks Christian last week. Paraclete, I just don't think they had the same talent level as they did last year. Man, we're going to get real boring. I'm picking them as well. Uh, Paraclete went out to Arizona, so props to that. Uh, took on a tough team at uh, Higley. Couldn't come away with the win. It was a close game, but. Yeah, Chaminade, they challenged themselves early. I think this, you know, Par- not not to knock Pericle, but Orange o- Oaks Christian, excuse me, a little bit of a step above. So I, I think they'll be okay. I think I like Chaminade on this one. The final game, it is the game of the week. It'll be the TV game. It will be the game that I will be at with Katie Austin. It is Centennial traveling to Orange Lutheran Shotgun. Do the Lancers have enough to pull off the upset? Yeah. You know, I think, you know, Orange Lutheran, they struggled early last week. They settled in the second quarter. You know, Ryan Holinsky ended up with 295 yards passing, three TDs, one, one of those to Kyle Ford, who's just a beast on the outside. Kyle Ford actually call, got called for two personal foul penalties for hitting guys too hard and blocking too hard, which is like, 
Well, the guy could, and you know, they were both clean looking to me. Neither one of them seemed to be warranted. But instead, he got penalties for it. You know, I think he's a beast on the outside. You had Logan Loya in the slot. I think this offense gets better and better. I think that after last week, they'll bounce back. And I think they do have enough. Even though Corona Centennial has a, a ton of offensive power with Gary Bryant and those two quarterbacks, you know, combining for over 400 yards offense, that defense will be the question. The offense of my, Orange Lutheran with all of its weapons, you have Ethan Ray committed to USC at tight end. You have Elijah Mojero committed to Cal at tight end. A lot of offensive weapons for Orange Lutheran. How does the Centennial defense uh, try to shut them down? Now, I will say the Orange Lutheran offense of line wasn't the you know the strongest in that game against San Juan Hills last week. So Centennial could find some some uh, pass rush lanes and stuff to to be able to affect Helinski. But I'm going to take Orange Lutheran in this one. I'm going to go the other way. I'm going to go with Centennial. I mean, I again, I saw them live. Gary Bryant had two unbelievable touchdowns. One of them, it was like a fourth and four. They were on their own, I want to say like 30. It was a screen pass to him, breaks a tackle, and he was just gone. He had another huge one um, on a deep post route, just ran past everybody and scored. So I like Centennial. Drake Jackson, another kid I want to mention for uh, Corona Centennial, number 99. He is huge. I stood next to him. I was scared. He's, he's listed at 6'4", 275 pounds. I think he's bigger. I'm not going to lie. Uh, but, you know, Centennial has the guys on defense. I, again, they they destroyed Chandler. I mean, it was not close. It was, it was a game that I thought would be, you know, down to the wire. And I thought maybe Chandler had the better team initially. But after seeing one or two quarters, it was pretty clear that Centennial was the better team. And this is a team that's top 25 in the nation. Easy. I'm going to go Centennial. Yeah, you know, Centennial could do that. And Drake Jackson, like you talked about, super versatile defender. You know, the, he could even play linebacker if you need him to. He's, uh, you know, very nimble on his feet. Play, you know, he can play inside on the defense line, play outside. He is a, he's a beast. And, uh, you know, he's a guy that, you know, if he has a good night, then I think Centennial can win. But I'm, I'm still going to go with Orange Lutheran in this one. All right. I'll be excited to watch it. I'll be there again with Katie Austin. Uh, Shotgun, anything you want to add before we get out of here? No, I'm just excited to have high school football back ready to get this season really going this week with some really big matchups. Should be fun. All right, that's it for week number one. We'll be back next week with week number two because that's how math works, one then two. For Shotgun, I am Tommy. We'll see you next week.